lesson, we're going to look at the theme of covenant. So covenant is Truth Point's 2020 theme for the year. So I thought doing a lesson on covenant uh, or covenant theology would be helpful. So what we're going to look at today, think about a picture, right, or a painting. So every good painting has both a frame and the painting itself. So when we think about the Bible, really this theme or idea, reality of covenant is the frame, so to speak, and the gospel is really the heart and center of the painting of all the beauties and wonders of God's story. So covenant really holds together this idea and pushes forth this idea of gospel that we see in scripture. So. When we see covenant, though, or when we think about covenant, what does covenant really mean? It means promise. So covenant in scripture is God's promise to his people of, of what he's going to do. And uh, we're going to try to cover this rather briefly, so I'm not going to be able to share everything on covenant, but I will give you hopefully a good helicopter overview uh, of the forest, so to speak, of what covenant is. So what, what covenant do we see in scripture, God, like between God and man? What are the covenants? Put simply, we see the covenant of works. And secondly, we see the covenant of grace. So the covenant of works, we see this in Genesis 1 through Genesis 3, 14. That's the covenant of works. If you think about the whole Bible, Genesis 1 <laughs> through Genesis 3, 14, that's the covenant of works. Then uh, Genesis 3, 15 through Revelation, that's the covenant of grace. Yes, the, the Old Testament uh, covenant of grace right after the covenant of works in Adam, the covenant of grace begins right after that. Uh, you may have thought, to yourself, oh, covenant of works, Old Testament, covenant of grace, New Testament. But that's, that's actually not how it works, which is um, fascinating. So let's jump in here. Uh, covenant of works. Why is it called the covenant of works? Well, Adam and Eve, when they were placed in the garden, they were required to obey God and not sin against him. So they had capability to do that. They were not born in sin like we are. So what was the requirement? Genesis 2, 17. Do not eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So what they do? They ate of it. And what happened? Uh, they're banished from the garden, and they they see that they're, they realize their sin, and uh, <laughs> then in Genesis 3.15. This is really interesting. So, uh, J.I. Packer said this. Listen to this. But God at once revealed to them, Adam and Eve, an embryo, a redemptive economy. A redemptive economy, an, em an embryo form. I love that. And you really see it in Genesis 3.15. So, this is the very first, Genesis 3.15, is the very first announcement of the gospel that God is going to do something, right? I've said before to you guys, you can view the Bible in this helicopter as creation, fall, which we just covered basically. Um, you know, we see creation happen, then the fall happens, and then God puts forth redemption and then restoration finally. But this plan of redemption begins. Um, now, before we jump into it, this plan of redemption and what we see in Genesis 3.15, I wanted to share that when it comes to covenant, the frame, right? If you had a picture, this, this frame we're talking about, if there were words inscribed all around the frame, like these beautiful words, you might have like something like that on a picture frame you have. I would say the words would be this. There's this promise, this heartbeat running throughout scripture and you see it often in uh, the Old Testament especially, but here's what it says. 
I shall be your God and you shall be my people. That's, that's like what's going on in covenant is, is God is saying, I'm dedicated to you. I shall be your God and you shall be my people. And so that's why you see God do all these things in scriptures because he wants to have relationship with his people and enjoy this, this relationship with them, um, this mutual joy. Uh, and uh, listen to J.I. Packer on, on this point. J.I. Packer says this in terms of covenant, the backbone of the Bible is the unfolding in space and time of God's unchanging intention of having people on earth to whom he would relate covenantally for his and their joy. So in order for that to happen, for God to do that, um, he begins working on the masterful painting of the gospel, whereby uh, he announces it here, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That phrase right there is when God is, is, talk, is speaking to the serpent, to Satan, and he says he, uh, the offspring of the woman, who's going to be the promised, uh, this promised Messiah, Jesus, he shall bruise or crush your head and you shall bruise or crush his heel. So commentators have pointed out that the importance of this verse is where the infliction occurs. So a head crush is a death blow. A heel crush is not a death blow. So we see that Jesus on the cross, he uh, crushes Satan, sin, and death, like forever, destroys them. Now, Jesus' heel was crushed. He died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And so, um, but Jesus did go through tons of affliction um, in his life and tons of sorrow uh, to save us. And so there was a, a heel bite, so to speak, a uh, not a death blow um, for him, but he was struck. And so that that's where we see the beginning of the covenant of grace. So... Um, covenant of grace revealed in the Old Testament. How does that happen? How do we see God painting his gospel in the Old Testament? And how were, how were people saved in the Old Testament? Well, the people in the Old Testament were saved in the exact same way as people in the New Testament. In brief, they had a forward look to the coming Christ. And by trusting in that promise, by trusting in him, by faith, they were saved. We have a backwards look to Jesus, to the promised Christ, who we find out his name is Jesus. And through faith in him, we are saved. So let's, let's take a look a little bit and, and see how God um, begins to make this painting of his covenant of grace in the Old Testament. So first, I want to highlight Noah. So Noah in the Old Testament, if you remember, after he and his family are rescued from the judgment of God, God paints a bow in the clouds. There's God puts a bow. We've seen a rainbow before. Uh, God puts a bow in the clouds. Now, it's interesting, that Hebrew word actually, uh, one of the definitions is war bow. And so Charles Spurgeon has pointed out that the bow is actually aimed upwards so that the, the strike of the arrow is pointed up, not down. So Spurgeon has said that what God's doing there is revealing that in order for him to give his, his grace and, and have, this, have this relationship with his people, uh, there has to be a, a satisfaction uh, for the punishment of sin justice and God's wrath has to come down or actually it's going to go up rather and it's just strange but like how come his, his judgment isn't going down how come the bow isn't going down well because Jesus would take that judgment Jesus would take the justice and the wrath of God so that we could experience the grace and the love of God forever so we see that foreshadowed even in Noah uh, and then moving on, uh, one of my favorites is uh, how it's foreshadowed in Abram. 
So Genesis, um, Genesis 15, five here, is actually, actually absolutely fascinating. So Abram, how does God reveal the gospel to Abram? How does Abram uh, become saved? Genesis 15, five, and he, God, brought him, Abram, outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Whoa. So Abram here is justified. We see Abram believes the Lord and God counts it to him as righteousness. So you might say, well, I don't see the gospel there. I don't see like, hey, Abram, believe in Jesus and you'll be forgiven for your sins or believe in the Christ to come. So the gospel was presented to Abram in a way that we are uh, not as familiar with. So listen to this. So why I would say, and I know that the gospel is being presented here is because of Galatians 3.16. So uh, check out Galatians 3.16. Go ahead and turn over there. Galatians 3.16. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Whoa. So, in this passage, in uh, Genesis 15, where it says, so shall your offspring be, what was happening there was God was telling Abram the the deeper truth of this of Isaac the deeper and greater Isaac the deeper truth here is that through your line I'm going to send the promised seed I'm going to send the Christ and through him what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in people of many tribes and nations and all these stars are going to come forth through this one offspring through Christ. And we see even in Colossians, Jesus as the firstborn among many brothers. He's the firstborn of, of the, the new state of being of the resurrection. So um, what that verse isn't saying is that, you know, uh, Jesus didn't exist before. Jesus has always existed. He was the Christ in the Old Testament, and then he was incarnated. He comes down from heaven and lives on earth and so, and he dies, and then when he rises, he's this firstborn, this, this um, new state of existence. And now through him, all these stars are coming, and um, all, these, all these different people. And so Abram believed that. He trusted in that, and that that promise would happen through his line. And, uh, and so, obviously, God declares him righteous because he has faith in Christ. So uh, that, that's Abram. And then let's move on to, uh, to Moses. So Moses is really interesting. So one of the big things he's known for uh, is rescuing God's people from Egypt. Well, it wasn't really, Moses wasn't the primary person who rescued God's people from Egypt. Uh, don't get me wrong, he did, but uh, have you read Jude 5, where it says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Who's behind the scenes doing the real rescuing? Jesus. <laughs> so Moses acted as God's um, representative at that time, but really Jesus was the one uh, who threw him, uh, who was behind the rescue. And so how do we see grace though in there? Well, how we see grace is Moses doesn't come to the people and say, all right, I got these tablets, guys. Now, if you obey these here, like I know you're doing a lot of work there as a slave, but you got to keep these laws and then I'll rescue you from Egypt. That's not what happens. God comes and by grace, by his own will, freely says, I'm rescuing my, these are my people, I'm going to rescue them. 
by grace he takes them out of Egypt, right? Not by works. They just they just needed to trust in Moses and to lead them out of Egypt. And then, so saved by grace, and then they're given the law to, to follow God. Um, and so you see grace there. And then what happens is I want to briefly touch on the priestly ministry in the Old Testament, Leviticus numbers, these big books that are just like, whoa, what is happening? Sacrifices, things dying, uh, people being sent out of the camp, and uh, this tabernacle built. What's going on here? Guys, really, uh, what was happening there was God was revealing uh, the uh, difficulty and the impossibility for man to save himself and that this is possible with God, that there would be this promised offspring who would be able to fulfill all of these laws and that he would in turn actually die for our sin so that the justice of God could happen, uh, the wrath of God would be poured out so that we could experience the love and grace of God. So there's all these sacrifices taking place, right? So why were the people making sacrifices? Well, the point of these sacrifices was if these people in the Old Testament were viewing them rightly, they're saying, okay, God is going to send the final sacrifice that's going to end all sacrifices. We see that very clearly in the book of Hebrews, where it talks about the once and for all sacrifice that suffice, that was sufficient. Now, all these sacrifices in the Old Testament are reminders, hey, trust in this promised offspring. He's going to come and he's going to be the final sacrifice. So, they were not meant to trust in those sacrifices themselves in the Old Testament. They were meant to look through them like a window to the final sacrifice in Christ. So that was that was what was going on there, really, in the Old Testament priestly ministry. Uh, last but not least, David. How does God reveal his grace through David in the Old Testament? Well, let's hit on the story of David and Goliath. So in that story, uh, I've heard pastors, preachers say, like, you got to be David. You got to conquer your giants. You got to slay your Goliath. And that's just a bunch of trash, to be honest with you, because what was happening there is, let me just, let me say it like this. So this person who, uh, who no one thinks could conquer Goliath, who doesn't have any presence of um, magnificent, extraordinary strength, right? Comes up and says, I'll fight Goliath. Um, and then what happens is he uses a weapon that no one thinks could slay the enemy, and he wins. And then all the people who are afraid and should be out there fighting are not fighting. And, and we see that once David slays Goliath, then all the people um, come behind him and move forward to victory. <laughs> that, that is, so who's the greater David? Jesus is the greater David. You're not the greater David. Jesus is the one who rides, who rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, not appearing as some um, great kingly figure, and then through the weapon of the cross, he conquers Satan, sin, and death, the greater Goliath. And, and then he dies and rises again from the dead, proving that he was victory. And now all of God's people, we, we, come to, who, we who trust in Jesus, who trust in him for the forgiveness of our sins, move behind him and move in towards life to bring about his mission and enjoy our relationship with God. So... That, that's really the story of David uh, and how we should view it now. Uh, so we're the Israelites in that story. <laughs> we're the ones who are uh, cowering back and afraid. We need a savior. And so Jesus is that savior for us. Um, now, not that there's no application we can get from David's life. You know, he was a man after God's own heart. And so we should strive to be that too uh, through Christ. And uh but it's interesting that all these Old Testament figures, right, are always, there's always this um, stain that you see on their lives. Like, 
you know, Noah gave in to drunkenness and David was an uh, adulterous murder. Um, Abraham, like, basically, like, sold out his wife twice. You know, there's all these stains that they have, so we don't look at them and say, oh, I've got to be just like these people. Like, they have, they have issues. Like, there's, like, God makes sure to show that because we need a, we need a greater Abraham. We need a greater Moses. We need a greater David. And so, so that's Jesus. That's the New Testament where, where, where God shows his grace finally through this promised Christ who was foreshadowed and symbolized throughout the entire Old Testament. There's all these types and shadows, you know, David's a type of Jesus. Moses is a type of Jesus. Uh, Noah is a type of Jesus, but they're not like, man, like they're, they're not perfect. And so, boom, you see Jesus as this perfect um, fulfillment. Uh, when, when he comes on the scene, it's even, it's even in Hebrews, it talks about he is the imprint of the exact nature of God. And so here, here comes uh, this promised Christ, this promised offspring, all the way from Genesis 3.15, who is the who is uh, fully God, fully man, conceived by the Holy Spirit, so he's not born into sin, and uh, these two these two natures he has uh, within one person, and so he lives this perfect life uh, that we should have lived, that Adam couldn't live, and then he dies uh, the death of a sinner, and God pours out all his wrath and judgment on him, so that anyone who has faith in Jesus alone is justified and forgiven for their sins. If you haven't done that, do that. Why? There's nothing to wait for. Trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and move out of the courtroom of God um, and move into the family room of God. And uh, that's all that's required in the covenant of grace. That's the beauty of this covenant of grace is that the gospel is a gift to anyone who believes. You can't earn it. Um, and, and then what we hear, the triumph of, of the grace is, is that phrase that I shared, uh, with you all that God says to us once and for all, I shall be your God and you shall be my people. And we now and forever enjoy this eternal relationship with God. And it, it, it's never going to end. And we'll be with him forever. So I hope that helps you to see a covenant in a greater light as you, as you look at through the Bible, you know, seeing this creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And I hope you really move into this day or this night enjoying your relationship with God, enjoying this gospel he's given us so that we can have him as our greatest joy in life, strive now to uh, make him your joy. And um, I hope uh, that you do that. And we'll see you next time. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweet. But holy trust in Jesus